Hello. We, Hello. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> today we are interviewing Master Charles Kwok of Honga, Mogwailan Honga from Canada. Hello. How are you? Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for asking. We are uh, really honored to have you in in my YouTube channel. Uh, well, the honor is mine. Can you start by introducing yourself a, a, a little bit about your Kung Fu history and martial arts history, please? Uh, well, my name is Charles, last name Kwok. Um, like uh, Kadu has introduced me, I'm from Canada. I was born and raised in Vancouver here. And my Kung Fu background is actually very diverse because I've, I've been around the different styles a little bit. And, you know, growing up, I've, uh, you know, changed styles a few times. Um, but my initial, um, initial approach to Kung Fu or um, introduction to Kung Fu was from my grandfather. Um, ever since I was born, I was able to walk. Um, my grandfather would uh, teach me some punching, some stances and whatnot, because he is from the, uh, the southern Hakka style uh, called dragon style, Long Ying. Um, so he practiced that. He was, my grandfather was a practitioner of Long Ying. And um, as I grew a little bit older, around maybe six or seven years old, um, well, I was heavily influenced by my grandfather into Kung Fu and I really liked watching Kung Fu movies and, and TV series and whatnot. So by the time I got to about six or seven, um, my parents asked if I wanted to go learn Kung Fu. And I said, of course, why, why not? Right. And I'll jump into it. Um, at the time, uh, they brought me to learn uh, what is, I believe, a uh, more northern style, like uh, Wushu, contemporary style. Like uh, lots of flashy movements, uh, like that kind of type. And I was bullied at school a lot. So, hey, I thought, hey, I learned Kung Fu. Maybe I can use some of this stuff. And, and lo and behold, it didn't work uh, <laughs> at school. So um, by the time I was about nine or ten, so a few years later, uh, my parents enrolled me into Taekwondo. And uh, I studied Taekwondo till about I was 16. And um, a buddy of mine said, hey, there's a, there's a Wing Chun school like opening up, uh, you know, it's around your house, like a few blocks away. And I said, well, let's go check it out. Let's go learn together. And at the time I was quite, I was quite already experienced in Taekwondo, you know, it was very confidence with my kicks and whatnot so I, but anyways I went to go learn Wing Chun at that Wing Chun school and it turned out I was I wasn't very impressed at all um due to whatever reason like I probably don't want to talk about but yeah but anyways I was not impressed and so I kind of left it at that um about another year or two later I was about 17 or 18 and then I, uh, I went to learn uh, what they call Chao Ga. Um, it's a southern style, but not the Hakka, not the, not the praying mantis, but uh, the, the Chao Ga, the Zhong or Chao Ga style, or some, some, some people call it the Hong Tao Choi Mei. So I learned that for about another year, two years or so. And after that, um, I left Vancouver um, I went to another city for university. Um, now, going back, uh, uh, this is a funny story because what led up to my uh, real, what I call real, um, getting serious about learning martial arts or Kung Fu is, uh, is when I met my, uh, my Wing Chun teacher in Victoria. Okay. So how it led up to that point is um, because I, how I had mentioned I was bullied as a, as a child, you know, learning Wushu. And uh, I thought Wushu didn't work. I thought Chinese Kung Fu didn't work. I, I, uh, I, went, I saw that initial Wing Chun school. I wasn't very impressed, right? And uh, I traveled to the States a lot. 
And um, I was always curious. So whenever I see a Kung Fu school, I would actually walk in and just take a look, right? Because I was curious and I was really passionate about martial arts. Um, the reason why I go to the States a lot is because my sister plays tennis and she's always competing. So I just followed up with my, my parents and her. We went down and, and when she's competing, I would go out myself and find a Kung Fu school or check them out. And I noticed that a lot of um, uh, Westerners teaching Kung Fu, but they were not authentic. All right. But uh, the ones that I've met are not. I mean, there, there are a lot of really good seafoods that are Westerners or um, out there. But this is from my experience at that time. So uh, I went to a lot of Kung Fu schools. I went to check it out. Didn't like it, was not impressed. So I already had it back in the back of my mind that Kung Fu is doesn't really work. And uh, especially when Westerners teach it, it it's probably doesn't really, not very good either. So by the time I went to university, uh, one summer, um, actually after the first year, uh, that summer, uh, I was bored. I have nothing to do. So I s decided to look in the phone book. Uh, there were still phone books at that time. Um, you know, what were some of the local martial arts schools that were available? And so I found a Wing Chun, uh, a person teaching Wing Chun, uh, turned out to be my Sifu afterwards. And he is, uh, he's a Westerner, you know, he's, um, and he's teaching Wing Chun, you know. So <laughs> I thought, well, another Westerner teaching Wing Chun, you know, it's probably not very good. And at the time, um, you know, I, I, I was very confident with my Taekwondo and, um, and whatnot. So I decided to pay him a visit. You know, I called him up and I said, hey, you know, I was a little cocky and I said, hey, you teach Kung Fu and he was very polite, you know, soft-spoken man. And he said, yeah, I, I teach Wing Chun. Like if you're interested, come and come and take a look. And, and I said, okay. Uh, so I went to his place and um, knocked on his door. He teaches out of his garage. Uh, he opened the door. I mean, he was a lot older than I am. I was 19 at that time, you know, a young, stupid, cocky boy. And this gentleman, a lot older, is in his 50s. And, uh, you know, he introduced me. He went, he took me inside to his garage, you know, introduced me about Wing Chun and his lineage of Wing Chun. And, um, you know, after a short talk and whatnot, you know, uh, with my initial intention to go kind of challenge him in a way, because, you know, I said, you know, maybe I should, I, I could do something like that. But so lo and behold, you know, at the, at the end of the conversation, he said, hey, let's play a little bit. And I said, what do you mean? You know, uh, I'm a 19 year old and you're, you're an old man, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I could probably, you know, I don't want to hurt you. And he's like, no, 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 no. Just play a, bit, a little bit. Like, you know, come with me with whatever you got. And I said, okay, you know, so we kind of started playing around, sparred a little bit. And, you know, within minutes, like not even minutes, like I had no idea why my kicks didn't work. I had no idea why my blocks didn't work. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. I, I found myself, you know, with my butt on the floor, like multiple times. I kept getting back up, kept, kept trying to, you know, do what I wanted to do, but, you know, it didn't work. And so that's how I um, really, that's like my first time to really understood and, you know, feel what real Wing Chun was like. And, you know, it changed my, uh, my perspective about, um, you know, uh, how useful Kung Fu is and that, you know, uh, I shouldn't be judging people by, you know, what, they, what their appearance is like, you know. So I, that really humbled myself. And so I started learning uh, uh, Wing Chun from him. Um, he's, he teaches the Wang Q lineage of Wing Chun. And before he, uh, he, before my teacher uh, learned Wing Chun, he, he learned the village style Hongga, you know, more of a village style Hong style. And he also taught me a little bit, uh, taught me a few forms in that style as well. So it got me really interested in, in, uh, in Hong style 
right? And uh, got me really interested in, in, in my, you know, culture and Chinese martial arts as well, because here I am, you know, this cocky little 19 year old, and I see this Western man teaching me about Chinese culture. I'm like, I was in awe because I was like, wow, you know more than me. And I'm, and I'm, I'm Chinese, you know, like, you know, I felt really shameful and all that. So, so that's kind of how I started, like, you know, getting serious with my, my martial arts. Um, and because I learned a little bit of the, the village style, I, uh, I was told there was a, you know, more orthodox styles like the Wong Fei Hong style. Right. So, um, uh, on the weekdays, you know, I would be in, in the city where my university is. And then on the weekends, I would travel back out to Vancouver because um, it was only about a two hour ferry ride. So I decided to go to Vancouver uh, to learn to find us a, a teacher to teach me, you know, uh, a more orthodox hung style. So I, I visited a few and finally uh, came to meet my Kung Fu, my Hong Ga, uh, Sifu. Uh, Master Joseph Kwok uh, of the Mokwai Lan lineage. And so, yeah, like long, and I've been with him ever since, you know. So that's basically how my martial arts um, background is sort of like. So uh, besides these styles, I've also dabbled in other styles such as uh, capoeira. Um, um, and also, but I, I, that didn't last long for me. Like, you know, I couldn't, uh, it was too physically strenuous for me. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, uh, besides, uh, you know, uh, Wing Chun, um, uh, Hong Ga. Oh, later on, I, I went down to uh, Los Angeles to, to meet my, uh, Wong Shun, uh, my, my teacher in the Wong Shun Learn lineage, Gary Lam. And, and he accepted me as a student as well. So um, I've been practicing Wong Shun Leung, uh, Wing Chun uh, as well ever since. Uh, since 2011, um, I started the Wong Shun Leung, uh, Wing Chun. Um, yeah, we are and, cousins. <laughs> yeah, we are cousins. Um, I, uh, you know, for fun, I also, um, I also learned uh, the white eyebrow style uh, under Master Wilkie Wu in Vancouver. Um, another reason why I learned the, the white brow style is because, you know, uh, I was told by my Wing Chun teacher that white brow style is a very deadly art, you know, and, you know, I was interested in learning about it too. So, um, so for fun, you know, I, I joined that club also because it's a Hakka style and it's very, it's a sister style of my grandfather's style, Long Ying style. So, so I decided to go learn some Hakka style, you know, because um, my grandfather is Hakka and, you know, I'm a Hakka man. So, yeah, so I decided to learn that. But I'm not a Sifu in that. I'm, I'm just, you know, still dabbling, still learning and whatnot. So officially certified as a teacher um, only in the, um, the Hongga Mokwalan style, yeah, of the Hong style. Yeah. So that's my background. Sorry to go all over the place because, you know, my, my, my background is, is a little bit all over the place. Yeah. It's a, it's a good story. I think we, we share a little bit of more life, the same story, but my, my style, my, my first style is like Wing Chun and I, I teach more Wing Chun, but had some other experiences, even in Honga. Yeah. Mostly Tang Fong Honga. Um, so can you tell us a little bit like um, the, histo the history of uh, your, your lineage of Hongar, especially the um, Mogwailan Mo as she's like a, a legend in the martial art community and a symbol for many people, you know, like especially women that get uh, inspired to, to learn Kung Fu? Yeah, um, so Mogwailan is... Um... If, if anybody knows, uh, Mo Kuelan is the fourth wife of uh, Wong Fei Hong. Um, so before she uh, married Wong Fei Hong, well, um, she was already, uh, you know, she was already very good in Kung Fu uh, uh, under the Mok, Mok Ka or the Mok family style, uh, which is a southern style that's surprisingly mainly uh, uh, known for their kicking. So um 
from what I was told, uh, the stories that was handed down to me uh, was uh, Mo Kui Lan, um, you know, obviously learned um, the Hong Ga from Wang Fei Hong. And after Wang Fei Hong passed away, she moved down to Hong Kong to, to continue teaching. Uh, prior to that, um, in terms of inspiring more females to, uh, to learn Kung Fu, um, uh, from what I was told a long time ago, uh, you know, the lion dancing, um, the, the lion heads were all only male performers. And um, so what I was told was uh, actually Mo Kui Lan was the first to organize uh, female uh, lion dance troops because um, the lion was considered sacred. And back in the old, old times, you know, uh, male and female, there was a more of a male dominate, like dominated society compared to female. So, so, it was, so technically females were not even allowed to touch the lions. That's what I was told. Okay. I don't, I'm not hundred percent sure if this story was true, but, but I was told that Mo Kui Lan, Si Tai, she, she even started the lion dancing troupe for women. So that really broke the boundaries. And also at the same time, you know, she had a, she had a quite a temper, I was told. And that sometimes, uh, you know, she would uh, be out, if she sees something that's not right, you know, she'll stand up for people. And um, there were stories of even people going to challenge her in fights. So she never backed out, right? And, you know, she lived a very long life. So, you know, I assume that those fights turned out pretty well for her, even though she was fighting men, you know? Um, so, which was very impressive, very impressive stories, you know, from what I know of Mo Kui Lan. And, um, yeah. Um, so after Wang Feng passed away, uh, she moved to Hong Kong and she started uh, teaching Hong Ga there. And that's when my Sifu started learning from Mo Kui Lan uh, in 1972, I believe, until Mo Kui Lan passed away in, in about 82 or yeah, 82, I believe she passed away. Did she teach like many students in Hong Kong or we don't have like any records of teaching, of her teaching Kung Fu in Hong Kong for the male groups too? Uh, she taught a lot of people, actually, from what I was told by my Sifu. Um, but she did not really market herself a lot. Um, like I was told, like, uh, you know, because of the Wong Fei Hong name, right, and Hong Ga. So she had quite a few students initially uh, in, in, this, in the 60s and maybe some a little bit in the 70s. Um, but for whatever reason, after she passed away, um, the lineage was not very marketed a lot, you know. Um, I guess uh, in, in terms of Hong Ga in Hong Kong, the most popular lineage would be the Lam Sai Wing lineage, right? Um, you know, the lots of his students, um, they had many, many students, very, very good students, um, you know, very famous uh, schools there compared to uh, Mo Kui Lan. Mo Kui Lan, well, I guess, was more you know, she didn't market herself a lot. And um, she mainly, you know, if she's not teaching Kung Fu, she was a, a, a bone setter, you know, a Chinese medicine uh, practitioner. Um, in terms of the lineage afterwards, you know, after she passed away, I guess um, uh, maybe the way I feel is uh, society has kind of, um, culture like society in Hong Kong kind of uh, shifted attention like the whole 70s kung fu craze was a little bit you know dying you know especially in the 80s you know and um, the Hong Kong economy was doing well in the 80s so I guess people were more focused on making money and and doing other things than than going back to learn to learn kung fu, and then by the time the eighties came around, Mo uh, Kui passed away in eighty two. So, um, I guess that was kind of it. I mean, there are some uh, si sok and si box that are still teaching in Hong Kong, but um, they, for whatever reason, they 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 also don't market themselves a lot. 
So I guess that's why in, in terms of knowing this lineage worldwide, it is not as well known. That could be the case. Let's see. And uh, your Sifu is a bone setter too, right? Did he learn it from, from her? Is it, uh, yes. is it like usual in the lineage? The, the, like does he teach, teach it to his students nowadays or mostly Kung Fu? Oh, uh, yeah, my Sifu teach us, uh, you know, the, the Tita as well as the, the Kung Fu. Um, but, you know, I'm a bit lazy, so I, <laughs> I was more focused on the Kung Fu, you know, especially when I was younger. I, I didn't focus too much on the Tita, but some of the students in our school, you know, they focused a lot on the, on the Tita portion as well, right? Um, there are formulas passed down from Wong Fei Hong and uh, Wong Kui Lan, uh, for the uh, the tita chow and uh, other medicine as well, so um, that has been passed down to us. Um, yeah, like we have we have both. It's not just the kung fu. Um, Sifu Joseph Kwok does teach the the tita portion as well and the toina and all that. Um, in your opinion, what what uh, makes the Mogwailan Honga lineage unique? What like is most different from other Honga lineages? Um, I would say comparatively, like when I look at our forms and some of the other lineages forms, uh, even the same forms, uh, ours are very simple. Like um, it's, I don't want to say it's not as flashy, which it isn't. Um, so, you know, um, so when we perform our forms, uh, our rhythm is a little bit different. So it looks a little more boring, like because it's it's more simple, I would have to say. Um, and we don't have a lot of forms. Uh, we basically have five hand forms. So we have the four uh, orthodox form, the Gongji for Fu Kun, the the Taming Tiger form, the Fu Hok Seng Yan Kun, which is the Tiger Crane. Uh, the Mian Kun, which is the, the five shapes, the dragon, leopard, tiger, crane, and snake form. And we have the, uh, the last form we learned is the Tsing Kun. So those are the main four forms. And then we also have one that's passed down from Mokwailan, from her Mokka lineage, called Lao uh, Sui Ji, means um, crushing the, uh, the fungus or the mushrooms. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, no, the the lingji, the you know the Chinese the really big giant mushrooms that are, that grow on trees. Uh, yeah, so we only have five hand forms, and then in terms of weapons, we only have another maybe five or six forms for weapons. So we don't have a lot. Um, so I guess that's the main a lot of main differences compared to our lineage from uh, from other lineages. And the the, the moga. Seth would be like the signature of the lineage, more or less. Um, so we that would be one. Uh, obviously, the, the people in our lineage will learn that one form. Uh, we also have the Yin Yi Siu, which is uh, a flute form, like a short stick form. That's uh, I, I, I haven't seen in other lineages. Okay. Um, and we also have the, the, the double butterfly knife or what we call um, in Chinese, the, in our set it's called a ji mo seng do, which means it's the, uh, the sun and mother knives. So it's a double short knife like the, like the Wing Chun Ba Jam Do. Um, so Mo Gui Lan was actually famous for, for that set as well. So uh, if you term, in terms of form uniqueness, I would have to say it's the Mo Gal form the the flute form and the the double uh, butterfly knife form very, for us very interesting and yeah. talking more about the style in general what do you consider like the core concepts of Honga Kung Fu core concepts I would have to say that uh, there's a lot of foundation training right uh, our stances are so important. Uh, the seiping ma, uh, from 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 uh, you know the one stance to another stance, and how to generate the power to the punch, is very important. Honga, 
um, which is very, um, how do you say it? It's very effective uh, in, 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 in my opinion, because um, our Hongga stances are so stable. Uh, I would compare our stances and launching a punch uh, like, an art, like, a, like an artillery, um, uh, like an artillery cannon, right? So our, our legs, you know, our stance would be like the, the braces of the artillery cannon. And then once our stances were grounded onto the ground and we launch with our hip and our stance, everything together to launch a punch, um, to me, that's very, uh, very powerful. Like it's very unique to me um, in terms of power generation from the Yu Ma. Uh, we focus that a lot. So uh, like, that's why I say we don't do a lot of, too much, a lot of flashy, flashy uh, moves. You know, there's no, not too many, there's no, no jumping around or high kicks or anything like that for us. Um, stepping punch, stepping punch, block punches, and uh, some of the other hand techniques is all based upon, okay, you have to have a very solid rooted foundation in order to generate those kind of power and uh, the speed and the punches. Yeah, that's what I, it, for myself, um, I find unique in, in, in my lineage. And do you have like specific trainings for strength and flexibility? I mean, like um, the hip, hipping arms and these kind of trainings? Yes, uh, so we have the Kak Sam Seng. Some people call it Da Sam Seng. Um, I know uh, many lineages, they only, they only hit with this side and this side, right? But to us, the Sam Seng is actually, well, you hit three times, but we hit with this side, this side, this bone, and we also hit with this side too. So we condition all three sides of our arms instead of just the, the two bone side, right? Um, we have the, every Hongga has the dynamic tension, uh, the pushing and pulling of the bridges, right? Um, to train the muscular structure and the tendons. Um, in, the, in the forms, you see a lot of just the hands, just the arms, but it's actually more, it's actually the whole body, not just your, your Q cell, the bridging hands. Um, uh, and then when, when one learns, start to learn the, um, the mnying, or even uh, when they get to learn the, the iron wire form, which is the Tsing Kun, uh, we incorporate uh, a lot of breathing techniques as well as, um, you know, even um, making tonal sounds so that, um, you know, we can uh, uh, health-wise and also to um, possibly, you know, uh, increase our ability in our uh, uh, physical ability as well when we train. So we have those. Um... So uh, in the iron wire set, I think it's a topic that many people like to know more. It's every sound has a purpose of training. Can you explain a little bit of this? Um, yes. So um, so there there are uh, different sounds uh, for different emotions. So. Um, you know, there's happiness, there's joy, and there's sadness, and then uh, um, and there's anger, right? So, people, we are uh, we are triggered. You know, we 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 are emotional, right? We are people. So, uh, and also emotions uh, also coordinate uh, in Chinese medicine the uh, to different organs in the body as well. So we try to use emotion to uh, trigger certain things in our body, uh, hopefully to have some health benefits, right? And the story is that, you know, uh, when people have an adrenaline rush, you know, they're really anger, they're really angry, or they're really, uh, through different emotions, they could, they could possibly trigger some more uh, physical abilities. Like there's that really old story about how how a, a mother, you know, uh, you know, a small woman, uh, if their baby or child is trapped underneath something and then they're able to lift something really heavy, 
that that old story you know um it's a little bit of coordination we have that intention in mind uh but uh to tell you the truth i i cannot 100 percent say that hey that is what it is uh but we do train towards with that mentality um in hopes that uh it would somehow beyond uh just everyday training we have something extra that could help us a little bit with our physical training very good i think and you said you have practiced the village style honga too can you explain a little bit the, the styles and especially the difference between village style honga and the wonfei hong So the village style um, Honga I learned uh, was from uh, a Sifu called uh, James Lore, um, Lo Keng Hong in, uh, in Toronto. And um, exactly the style that was, that, uh, you know, where the style came from, I'm not 100% sure. Um, as I was told that he did learn from uh, many, many Sifus. Um, so not just Honga, but even um, there were a little bit of Choi Le Fat influence in it as well. Um, so obviously the forms are all different. So they don't have like tiger crane or something like that. It's, um, these forms are not well known at all, but the stances are, are similar, right? There's the Seiping Ma and the, you know, the, the, the Jim Ma and stuff like that. Um, in terms of performing the village style compared to the Wongpeong style, I would say that uh, the village style is a lot more aggressive, and um, which uh, I think is really cool and really fun to practice those forms because um, you're supposed to be able to perform and practice those forms at 100% speed and power. Um, I was told that some some sea sok and sea box in that lineage, when they were younger, they can do like five or six nonstop of those forms, like at 100% speed and power. And so the idea is, uh, you know, when you're in a fight, you you have your cardio um, and also the the deadly techniques, and that you don't you don't stop like when you're when you actually have to engage in the in combat. So. Uh, but in terms of foundation training, I think the orthodox uh, Wong Fei Hong um, uh, style is, is a lot more focused on foundations and like uh, a stance training from one stance to another stance to moving, you know, the rooting of the, of the, of the horse. Yeah, so I'd say that would probably be more, the, more so the difference. And the, the village style, uh, the forms are... Uh, a little shorter most of them uh not as long um as the uh, some of our forms um from well at least passed down from mock line anyways um so yeah very good and have you trained uh other kung fu styles what were like the the things you found similar the things you have more like difficult between Uh, like cross training sometimes it's hard because there are some people styles do a little bit different how was it for you um i think uh the idea of uh, relaxation is the hardest because every style their idea of relaxation is a little bit different You know, I'm pretty sure you've trained in Wing Chun, you've trained in a bunch of styles. They always tell you to, in Cantonese, they always tell you to Fong Song or Fang Song in, in, in Mandarin, right? So the way you Fong Song in Tai Chi, for example, is different than your Fong Song in Wing Chun. And then, and then I thought that, okay, when I trained Wing Chun and, and I learned a bit of Tai Chi as well at one point, um, and then I went to learn white brow bat mei style and their idea of, wake, of relax is just relax relaxing is completely different they, they kept telling me to, hey you gotta relax you gotta relax but i'm like i am relaxing and i thought like i could do it but i still don't meet their standards you know i think um it's really hard to 
for me, it's harder to uh, uh, to change the way I relax. You know, every time I start a new style because the requirement is a bit different. Yeah, and I think like Hong Kong is known by being a harder styles, but I've seen people performing it like good level, and they do like they are really relaxed in in a Hungar way, right? But we can compare this relax with like Bagua and Tai Chi because they're yeah. different, right? Right. Um... Hongka is actually very relaxed. Like, you know, uh, even when uh, when I learned from the Mokwela lineage or even with the village style, like it's it's hard, but then the execution has to be relaxed because if you're not relaxed, you you lose a lot of speed, right? You want to be fast too, right? So you don't want to tense up your muscles. So um, there is tension training, right, in Hongka. Um But uh, I'm not sure if you ever tried this. Uh, if you ever tried to tense up all your muscles for as long as you can, right? Like, and just tense it up, I don't know, for a minute or two minutes. But once you release that tension, you're, you're completely in a relaxed state, right? So I believe uh, Hong Ga actually balances the, the relaxation and the, and the tension very well because there's the tension training. And then there's the focus on the relaxation when executing the techniques. So, but then again, like I said, every style has his own methods and his own requirements of, uh, of, of relaxation. So sometimes I can't say that, oh yeah, that style is not relaxed at all. Well, I mean, their, their requirement is different, you know? Um, Or uh, maybe, maybe like, like, like you said, uh, compared to Bagua, I mean, obviously it's, it's not as flowing as Bagua, right? Because uh, there is uh, set punching, you know, and blocks and whatnot, right? So that could be uh, a misconception in a way. I, I don't know. <laughs> I think one of the things that you told now is really important because people sometimes don't know how to do the difference between the training and the fighting. So, okay, okay, if you are doing a, a big set in Honga with dynamic tension, you are doing a physical training. So, uh, I think uh, if you won't um, fight doing like this kind of things, like the no, tension. Yeah. So, it's right. more a training As I say, sometimes my students sets are training, training things, not just like a flying and see everything. You are doing a, a training. Yes, training and application is different, right? There's um, when you're training. I mean, there's 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 all different types of training too, right? There's application training. There's physical training. I mean, there's uh, even physical training. Uh, You know, you can you can define it as you know conditioning, right? There's that kind of training, and then there's also your your cardio conditioning, right? As well, right? So you can't say that well if the guy's running, then he's training the fight. Well, in a way, yes, you can, right? Because you know which MMA fighter doesn't train cardio, right? But you can't say that oh yeah he, he's going to be running and when he's in the fight. Well, yeah, he would be running, but. <laughs> But you won't be running around in a cage like that, right? So, um, my question is like one of the things, for example, what's your opinion about changing methodologies of training, changing sets, maybe in a way like, do you think you teach is exactly the way you was taught back there, or, or if you are teaching now, you teach it different? What's your opinion about this? Um, I think I have to teach differently nowadays. Um, the reason is uh, I do feel that, you know, it, no, it's, it, you shouldn't do everything cookie cutter, right? Like the, the forms I teach, I will teach the way I was taught, right? Because uh, I'm not really changing the forms or anything. Those are set forms. You know, those are your alphabets or your dictionary you go back to when you're, you know, when, when you want to learn Kung Fu. But in terms of um, 
uh, different people. I think people learn differently. Some people you need to really show them. Some people you have to tell them, right? Um, some people, you know, they they won't listen to you unless you beat them up, you know, a little bit <laughs> nicely, right? You know, like it, it, everybody's different, right? Um, and we're not all fighters, you know. That's the that's the thing I I, I think uh, on my martial arts journey. Uh, my about 30 something years martial arts journey, uh, uh, I finally come to the realization that, you know, um, you really have to know yourself, right? Um, it's a journey to know yourself. And because a lot of people get into Kung Fu or they get into MMA, you know, thinking that, oh, they're going to be a fighter. You know, we're not all fighters. People are not all fighters. You know, um, not, not all of us have the killer instinct mentality to really hurt somebody. Um, so there's also people that join Kung Fu or they join a martial arts for different reasons, right? Some people just want to be part of like a legacy, you know, like, uh, like oh, like for me, some a little bit of it is, okay, I'm part of this Hongga lineage, you know, I'm part of this lineage, you know? Um, it feels a little special that way, right? I mean, to some people, it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, and honestly, you know, I live in Canada, like, it's generally pretty safe here. How often do I really get into fights? You know, even if I'm a fighter, like, I mean, there's not that many chance for me to get into conflict with people here. Right. So, so, so everybody comes in for a little bit of different reasons. And then you kind of have to teach them differently, uh, depending on, I believe, uh, you know, their mindset you know, what kind of personality they are. Um, I'll give an example. Uh, I had a, I had a, uh, a man wanting to learn to fight and he was a dentist. Okay. <laughs> it's funny because after I said, I said, are you sure you want to learn the applications, you know, and the conditioning and all that? And he said, yeah, yeah, this is the, this is what I want. This is what I want. I said, okay, you want to try it? Well, you know, I'll give you, you know, what is required in our school, you know, for some of that training. And after three classes, he was gone because, you know, he said he couldn't take it, you know. So obviously he joined for the wrong reason. And then from my experience, I should have persuaded him that, hey, you know, this might not be the real reason you want to join. <laughs> and I can teach you in a different way and you can learn uh, better you know, the different aspects of Kung Fu rather than just that, which, you know, he didn't get anything out of it, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's really funny because I think all, all Sifus have like similar stories. Like sometimes people come to me and say, oh, I want to learn the same way people used to learn, the same way people learn in Hong Kong. And I say, oh, are you sure? They say yes, and I, and I know he will quit soon because yeah. it, it demands a lot. And even if he wants, usually people don't have the time and the effort and the wish to put it everything uh, into learning this kind of content. So it's it, yeah, to me, like martial arts learning is a, is a lifestyle. Um, it's, it's something that's, um, to me, uh, it's part of my life, right? It's not just really a hobby. Um, cause I, for me, I think about martial arts, like, like anytime, almost anytime throughout the day, like it, you know, how I can improve and all that is part of my lifestyle. So every time I, I have a new student, I always tell them, I'm like, Hey, you I mean, it's great that you're here and you're interested and you're curious, but uh, Kung Fu is not for everybody, you know, like, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it takes a lot of, uh, commitment and time, um, and a lot of thinking too. Um, and you may not, uh, you may not have time for other things, you know, if, if you, if you want to get to a certain level or you, you want to get good, right. Yeah. Um, you know, you, 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 you won't, you won't be spending as much time with family or girlfriends, you know, <laughs> and 
you know, uh, or whatnot, you know, you're a partner or, 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 you know, you, like for me, I, I, I don't even play video games anymore. You know, this is the only thing I do. Right. Like I gave up all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, just to be focused on this. So this is part of my life. So, um, yeah, like I always tell people it's, um, it, it's not for everybody. Yeah. There is some, there's something for everybody, but it's not for everybody. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Two two years ago, I had a neurological disease and lost like all the movements because of okay. COVID. And when I was in the hospital, I used like to sit in the bed and stay as like doing the home adaptation, the, the, the thing yeah. I learned, breathing and doing like training and even sit. And the doctor was like, oh my God, what are you are doing? You are like <laughs> almost dying. And I say, oh, but I want to keep like healthy the best way i can <laughs> yeah you want to keep moving right yeah yeah it's like you you can stop <laughs> there is like this this thing inside you that don't let you stop that's good that's the fighter's mentality <laughs> <laughs> you don't give up yeah and what do you consider uh the problems we are facing nowadays like how we can make it relevant in the modern era uh i'm a little bit more pessimistic in terms of uh the development of kung fu uh, nowadays um first of all i mean because chinese kung fu it's so broad there's so many styles you know there's so many different approaches right and in order to keep Kung Fu relevant, you know, marketing, marketing is important because, you know, you got to have some good fighters uh, representing the style or the lineage, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, people's minds are focused on, well, does it work? You know, like, uh, you know, that's what people think, right? And it's, it's tough because there's so many styles, you got to have these people to represent that style but then like i said you know not all of us are fighters you know some of us may be teachers you know maybe we're really good at absorbing the information and passing it down to someone else in hopes that this information sometime down the road it would it would get to a, an interested fighter you know that maybe be able to utilize some of this stuff and finally represent the, the style or the lineage, right? Um, so I think it's, 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 it's quite hard. Um, and also like even for myself, you know, all these years of practicing, I've come to the realization that, you know, I'm not really a fighter myself either, right? I, I've been in the fights, but am I, am I gonna, like I'm, I'm gonna turn 40 soon. I mean, I mean it's too late for me to, kind of just try to train hard like like a 20 year old and maybe get into MMA or UFC or something like that right it's it, it would be tough and also like you know I'm 40 I don't want to get hurt <laughs> <laughs> it takes a longer time to to recover right you know um and I've got other commitments in life too you know I I, I have a family right so there's a lot too many factors uh you know that's on the negative in my opinion you know, in terms of development of Kung Fu. But, I mean, I, I don't want to say this. There are many, many people out there, many Sifus that are very capable, many good fighters in Kung Fu. But in general, um, uh, I don't think there's enough. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we are facing, I agree with you, and I would like to say this, I think we are facing a problem of generations, for example. Your generation, you have uh, more Kung Fu fighters than my, in terms of Sifus that want to learn uh, real fighting. Because like, Kung Fu was quite popular, even because of the movies. And so, get really attracted to people. Nowadays, I think, as MMA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai, uh, people 
that are natural fighters and that want to learn how to fight better, they go to these arts. Mm -hmm. And people that want to like, um, they are like in cosplay conventions, they do, want to socialize, be part of a group, and or they like more the artistical and cultural thing, so they go to go for. So that's, I think it's a problem of the my generation that I really few people want to learn Kung Fu because of the fighting, you know. Mm -hmm. And there are more choices for younger generations now too. Um, like my father's generation or even my grandfather's generation, even learning Kung Fu is, is their entertainment to some of them because they didn't have computers, they didn't have self, they didn't have, you know, smartphones or tablets or anything they didn't have video games nothing like this right so learning kung fu is uh, you know it's also a, an entertainment so more people are learning kung fu back in the day right compared to now now you know kids you know uh, you want them to put them in a horse stance for for even five minutes they won't even do it you know like uh, they'd rather just sit somewhere and play with their smartphones right and the parents too you know, uh, I've had, uh, I've taught kids where, uh, you know, they, they ended up crying to their parents. They don't want to come because their parents, and then their parents see, oh, they're training so hard. It's so, you know, they, 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 they don't want their kids to go through cat, that kind of a uh, hardship, right? Like, and then they stop bringing their kids over, you know, like, that's also another thing too. I agree. So in your opinion, like, how to keep traditional? And, and at the same time, uh, adapt to make people interested? That's a difficult question. <laughs> How to keep it traditional and keep people interested? Yeah. Is that your question? Yeah. Um, it, it's, again, I think it's really tough. Um, because it's, a, to me, I see it as more of a niche market. I mean, there is always a market. There is always going to be people that are interested in traditional stuff, right? But it's not the general public anymore, right? There is a market for it, but it's a smaller market. Um, I mean, we can only try our best to educate the next generation as to why tradition is important, why what we're doing is important, right? Right? You can only hope that they will take it, take up an interest, and you know, and learn this stuff, and hopefully pass it on. Um, for myself, uh, I can only control myself. You know, we, we're, as a martial artist, we're learning to control ourselves, right, constantly to understand ourselves. So I can only control myself. I can only learn as much as I can, and do my best to teach it. Right, whatever happens later. You know, it's completely out of my control, really. I agree. I, I actually in the same mood nowadays. When I was a little bit younger, I was thinking, yeah. oh, I, I need to find some, <laughs> some people to pass on and teach so things won't, uh, will disappear. But now I, I think you're right. I think we have to focus in our own training and do the best. And... The other part is up to the people, right? Yeah. It's not up to us, you know. The only part that's up to us is our own training. And, you know, uh, we do our best to train ourselves, like, the best we can and and teach the best that we can, right? If someone's willing to learn. I see. And in the sense of marketing, what's your opinion about uh, Kung Fu competitions? especially sets and sanda because here in brazil we have like for example people practice traditional kung fu but when they go fighting they use more like sanda we have like mm -hmm. a mentality of oh we learn traditional kung fu but when it's time to fight it's sanda what's like your opinion Mm, I think Sanda is actually very good to promote Kung Fu if, uh, if, if whomever is joining those comp Sanda competition can use some of the different Kung Fu techniques, 
maybe you know uh, that way that in a way we can market it better following the rules of course because sanda does have rules right i mean you know you do have the really heavy boxing gloves for sanda which limits uh some of the techniques you can use right but in terms of um sets and forms competition uh i'm a little bit against that um because like i said there's too many kung fu styles out there um as per the judges you know uh i mean for me i mean i can only qualify myself to judge maybe hong ga maybe wing chun and maybe white brow but way right like if someone to someone wants me to judge tai chi or something like i would feel that i'm not qualified to to judge that right because i i don't practice it you know um and even not even different styles even different lineages we do we do sets so we do our, our our horses our stances a little bit different like what makes your lineage's stance better than my lineage's stance right if if two people were of the same level you know i just think it's it's just not fair uh performing the sets i agree you know if you have a you know an, an event it's um it's an, it's sort of an entertainment in a way you know to show people okay this is what the set looks like you know um in terms of performance is fine but for uh forms and sets uh competition i i kind of disagree with that um now back to sanda um i think that sanda can modify some more rules to be a little bit more closer to mma or mma or ufc style um and then promote kung fu hopefully i think that would be uh, if if there are people that are willing to go that route and to promote kung fu that way i think that would be a good marketing uh, a way to market kung fu and maybe trying to reach like mma uh, ufc competitions what do you think this sorry what about ufc competitions uh, like trying to not only in, in uh, not only being part of standard competitions but trying to go like against other martial arts like in ufc and trying to promote kung fu in this kind of competitions what's your yes um i think i mean it's good that uh some if if there are kung fu practitioners out there that want to join these tournaments i encourage them to to train properly and join them and make a you know hopefully they can make a name of themselves like they don't they don't even have to be like really famous like you know ufc champion of the world or something like that even more more local competitions you know and have that recorded you know that you have been out you know fighting you know trying to use these techniques that you've trained um because i know even even early ufc i mean there were some traditional uh traditionalists like even a honga practitioner like onesis uh peruno um he 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 used honga in his uh you know ufc fights um i i think uh i could be wrong but i do think that you some like organizations like ufc they have a set kind of uh a rule or or a guideline as to how you have to train and what you have to train in order to allow you to join these uh you know higher tier tournaments right you have to be part of uh a gym or a team or something like that but but not all kung fu styles train the same way right cardio maybe but in terms of technique like why why do you need to really have no a muay thai like kick or why do you need to know boxing in 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 or or even maybe just one of the grappling styles like bjj wrestling or something like that in order to to be qualified to to fight in in a tournament right um that I, i'm not 100% sure as to why that's the rules that's because that's what i've heard 
Um, but, you know, if there are tournaments like uh, UFC type or MMA type tournaments that some Kung Fu practitioners would like to join, then, yeah, you know, I, I encourage them to do it, you know, if, if, they, if they're training properly, you know, um, obviously, you know, you can't do certain deadly techniques in the, in the ring because, you know, that's not allowed and you don't want to kill anybody, right? Uh, and mind you that that's not that easy to do anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, in terms of marketing, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, if there are practitioners out there that would like to use some Kung Fu techniques and see how it could, how they could make it work in those um, sort of, uh, you know, in the cage with those set rules, within the rules that are allowed, if they can make it work, I think that would be uh, some of the ways to, to market uh, Kung Fu. And I have two more questions that are questions that I do to every people that I interview, okay? Mm -hmm. One is how you talk it a little bit of it already, like how do you see Kung Fu in 100 years? That's a tough question. Uh, I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, First fine. of all, I, I, I won't be here in 100 years, right? And, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it would be recorded virtually. I see. You uh, know, uh, like, uh, I believe um, uh, the Hong Kong practitioner in Hong Kong, Hing Chao, he's doing that. He's, uh, he's going around Hong Kong, seeing those, meeting those different masters and having them virtually recorded their forms and everything. Maybe in a hundred years, um, you know, it'll just be a museum or a, or a library where we can go. Okay, this was this style, and you know, this is what it looks like. You know, maybe it'll just all be virtual. Yeah, uh, that's really interesting. You're talking about Ming Chao because he he did a bridge actually to to me meet my uh, Hakka Tuga Gao Sifu. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tuga Gao is a really small style, it's a family style that my Sifu when became the lineage holder in 2015, he, he decided to open the style to people outside the clan. So I think the technology, this Hakka Kung Fu project of uh, In Chao, really help it it's like to spread a little bit and don't let it die so i think in this way technology helps a lot what's your opinion about like online training online training to be honest i think uh it's only for two things it could be for two things number one um People just want to imitate the form, okay? You can learn the form, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, and it's good for exercise. It's kind of like training, you know, with an aerobics video or something like that, you know. Um, number two, uh, I think it would be beneficial to some people who are more... Uh, you know, they've, they've already reached a certain level in, in a style or Kung Fu or martial arts of some sort. And the online training would be more of a, like a seminar uh, type, right? Maybe uh, through seminar teaching um, online that, you know, they can help somebody, you know, to, to improve to a certain level, like men mentally, Right, maybe oh oh I didn't know I could do that, you know, I didn't know I could I could use it that way or something like that, right? But in terms of real training, uh, I don't agree with online, right? Because for uh, I'm a I'm all I also learned Wing Chun, right? So there you obviously you know how who are we gonna have who are we gonna cheese out with like yeah. online? We cannot, right? Yes. So um, in terms of uh, uh, trying to 
practice techniques, applications, and, uh, you know, or under pressure, that's impossible online. You know, you can't train that. But online in terms of form and theory and, you know, uh, ideas. Yeah, sure. Great. I've been teaching and also uh, learning online in this COVID times. And my experience was like, when you turn it especially difficult, it's almost impossible. But I agree with you, like if you have certain level and you need like a little bit of mechanics, uh, corrections, like do a little bit more like using the heap, these kind of things you can use. But like the thing of touching is really important then. So this is really difficult. At certain point, you will need to, uh, to meet the teacher and complete like this this part. In my opinion. Yes, you do need a an actual teacher, somebody to train with you, nonstop to drill these things uh, into muscle memory, right? Um, obviously, you you and I are from the same lineage of uh, Wing Chun. You know, you know we talk about the lines all the time. But if you don't train the lines, you don't know that your lines are off. Yes, exactly. Right? You won't know. Like, you think, oh, yeah, okay, like, my line's correct. You know, my line's correct by my training myself. But when you have pressure and everything, it all yeah. goes out the window, you know? You need yeah. somebody to train with. You can't do that online unless there's some sort of, you know, virtual dummy, or maybe a hundred years later, you know, like the, the question you asked, maybe a hundred years later, we, we have, uh, you know, physical dummies that can imitate people, right? Like androids that we can train with. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll have something like that, right? Yeah. So I, we can learn online. Yeah. I uh, already have seen a, a small video of a robot doing like body train set. <laughs> yeah. And um, my... I, I don't know, do, do you have any topic that you want to discuss that you think it's important? That's important. Um, well, to be honest, I really hope that uh, parents will encourage their children to be uh, more aware of uh, the traditional arts, not even just Kung Fu, but traditional things uh, so it doesn't get lost in the future. Um, the child's interest is really important, but the encouragement of parents is also very, very important. Um, I mean, in our, my perspective, you know, we're talking about Chinese Kung Fu. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, as even as Chinese parents, you know, uh, they would encourage their kids to learn Chinese Kung Fu more and not just look at, you know, other side of the, the grass is greener on the other side, you know, um, uh, because there are many, many good things that Chinese Kung Fu can offer to children. Um, you know, I really hope the parents can really do a big, bigger part um, into encouraging their, their children to, to, to be more physical and, uh, you know, learn about traditions. Yeah. Even with the parents nowadays, I see a lot of them are not like not traditionalists themselves. So I think it would be tough, but, but I hope, you know, that there would be a, some sort of a, a change. In, in this way, uh, what would you recommend to like, uh, how to choose a good CTO. Like, I am a parent, I want to put my children in the Kung Fu, and there are many schools available. How would you recommend them how to choose? Uh, you know, I think a lot of people might hate me for this. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, most of my sifus that have taught me really well, that I've learned a lot from, they're not businessmen. So a lot of them, I mean, 
uh, most of them, okay? They're not businessmen. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a little bit tough. I mean, I mean some, some, some people do really well. They teach really well and they make a lot of money too, right? Um, but in my experience, uh, you know, even my Wing Chun teacher in Victoria, uh, the, the Wang Q lineage, you know, I, he, he didn't charge me much. You know, and um, he was willing to to teach everything I I wanted to learn, and every time I have a question, you know, he was always there to answer. You know, um, I guess uh, patience. You know, you see a a teacher that has a lot of patience is really important, right? Um, because if a student has a question you know, it takes time to understand exactly where that question is coming from, right? It may not be 100% what the, uh, what, the, what the student is asking. It may be, sometimes even the student may, may not, may not uh, you know, really understand what they're asking, you know. They were probably asking for something else, but then it came out different. So I think uh, a really good Sifu needs to have a lot of patience. I agree. Yeah. I agree with everything. <laughs> um, my last question is what advice would you give to a, a beginner that is like starting the Kung Fu journey and another advice you would give to advanced a student or even Sifu that wants to reach like higher levels? Mm. Now, this is a hard question because uh, for beginners, if they're just curious um, and they're just starting, I would suggest they go to different schools, meet different Sifus uh, to see who you can really connect with. And if, um, and if that style is really the style you like, right? Uh, I mean, for me, it's... I go down a rabbit hole when I'm interested in something new, you know, I do all this research, like online, you know, searching this, find more information about a style, you know, watch videos, what it looks like, um, you know, and ask myself why I want to learn this. Right. And um, so, you know, go expose yourself to different, to more things. Right. Um, and then, and then, you know, maybe a year or two, you know, then start to narrow, narrow them down, right? For beginners. That's good. Yeah. But as for intermediate and Sifu level, uh, I guess uh, maybe have an open mind more. Sometimes uh, people, when, when they get, you get to a certain level, you you think you've been there, you think you've done that, and you don't want to hear what people have to say, you know, you're, you're, you're not really opening to learning new things. Um, you don't actually have to quit your style and learn something new per se, but um, having an open mind, willing to come out, um, would expose yourself to other people, right? Um, from my experience, you know, because I, um, you know, I'm always a student. I, in my mind, I'm always a student. I'm always wanting to learn more to, to get better. Uh, I meet lots of different people, you know, I'm, and then some of these people, they, they lead me to some of the really good seafoods that I've, that I've learned from, you know. If I had not kept an open mind, I wouldn't have met these seafoods, right? So in other words, be nice, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like yeah. this behavior of in, in the Kung Fu, I think it's really important too. Now. You, yeah. you have this connection to the Molan and exchange with other Sifus, exchange ideas, exchange trainings. Like we are all one big family, right? Yes. Uh... Yeah, we're all one big family. Uh, you know, Molam Yaka, right? Uh, Chinese Kung Fu, especially Chinese Kung Fu, you know, we're, we need to do our best to stick together, you know, and then hopefully to improve each other 
so that you know we can we can make you know we can make a comeback you know kung fu can make a comeback you know can uh, you know be more popular to to promote this so i would like to thank you again for for being here for the interview it was awesome i learned a lot i am sure the people will see it will uh, learn a lot also in the in the description of the video i will put the link of your youtube channel that you have some some videos there right so people can see a little bit more of the more i learned from the lineage and that's it i, I don't know if you want to say something Oh no! I thank you for this honor of uh, of an interview for me. I was uh, taken by surprise because, you know, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm I'm maybe because I'm always thinking that I'm a student in my head, so I didn't think anyone would come and interview me, right? Like, <laughs> so I was a little bit taken by surprise, and uh, I'm actually quite honored that uh, yeah uh, to be here today, and I hope that um, you know because this is my first interview. Um, I do apologize if I'm all over the place or trying to get my thoughts together when I'm answering a question, uh, as, as I am a little bit nervous today. So, but you know, I hope that you know whatever I said today can can be a benefit to whomever decides to watch this video or any of your videos. Thank you so much. So, people that uh, is watching, don't forget to like and subscribe. My my channel and Sifu Cook channel. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.